Well, good morning, everyone. It is August 11th, and we are going to go ahead and get started with our Tuesday Zoom chat. Um, today, we have a special guest, and we have a lot of folks who are going to be joining us, so we want to respect your time and go ahead and get, get going. Um, so my name is Sonia Bingaman, and I am the Regional Manager of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities Sacramento Regional Office. Our office covers 10 counties, Sacramento and nine surrounding counties. And we have uh, 11 other offices around the state. So the state council is statewide and we have offices um, all over. Many of you are familiar with your local office because some of you are from Southern California, San Diego, um, Central Valley. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Um, you all have regional centers in your area. You all have state council offices in your area. And what we're going to talk about today is statewide and actually nationwide. And so it's applicable to everyone. Um, so welcome to the call. Um, I'd also like to introduce Kathy Bryan. Kathy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Bryan, and I'm the Community Program Specialist for the State Council for the Greater Sacramento Region. Um, so Sonia and I uh, are a two-person office. Um, anyway, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, I'm going to be helping out with the chat box, so feel free to post any questions in that chat box or uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Um, if you have any technical difficulties um, with the Zoom call, you can post it in the chat box and we can try to help you out with that as well. Um, also, toward the end of the hour, um, we're going to be launching a poll on the screen with two questions and we hope you all can participate and let us know what you think about the training. I think we're really fortunate to have Catherine Weston uh, be with us today. And uh, thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. So the State Council is established by... You're okay, Adam? Yeah. You want it louder? Louder. Where's Adam? your... You have a... Mine's over here, my volume button. Okay, I put Adam on mute for right now, but we definitely want you all to talk um, later and ask questions. So for right now, I'll um, put him on mute. Okay, so the State Council is established by state and federal law as an independent state agency to ensure that people with developmental disabilities and their families receive the services and supports that they need. Through advocacy, capacity building, and systemic change, SCDD works to cons achieve a consumer and family friendly system. Um, of individualized supports and help folks to access the community and all of the services that they're eligible for. During COVID, we've been reaching into the community to find out what the issues are for families. And one of the things that we came up with was organizing these Tuesday Zoom chats just to give people direct access to those who are in charge of some of our organizations, um, hearing what policies are, what regulations are, what things have changed during COVID, as well as we've had some family advocacy groups and self-advocacy groups involved as well. So we want everyone to have a voice and if you have ideas for who we can have as a guest or a topic that you're interested in, please always feel free to reach out and uh, email me. Uh, Kathy will be putting uh, some information in the chat box uh, that will help you to access us afterwards. Um, we know you're all busy and probably pretty zoomed out at this point, but we appreciate you joining the call. Um, this is really the beginning of a discussion about HCBS settings. It may be a new concept to many of you, especially if you're uh, family members. Um, providers, I'm sure, have been hearing about this for a couple of years. Um, we're all still learning together, so if you have no idea what you just signed in for, that's okay. Um, this is really going to be an overview, and Catherine has been generous enough to go ahead, and we've scheduled follow-up trainings that will go into more depth and more detail about HCBS settings in September and in October. Um, so in the chat box, you will see links to the Zoom trainings that we've already set up. Um, one will be more of an overview of all programs and how HCBS affects them. And the second training in October will really focus on residential um, services and how HCBS will affect residential services. So please feel free to go ahead and sign up for those uh, two trainings if you wanna learn more and go into more de detail. Those will be more, um, more detailed trainings as opposed to a chat like we're gonna have today. Um, many of you forwarded questions to us. And so we wanted to take a few of those that really don't have to do with HCBS settings, but are more general or um, 
a different topic uh, related to regional center services. So a couple of those I wanna go ahead and just address right now. And then others of your questions will address throughout the chat. And then at the end, we'll also have time for you to ask any questions that have come up for you. Um, so the first question that came hey, in- Sonia? Was, yeah, go ahead. Sonia? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, can I interrupt? Um, a couple people have asked if you could um, speak a little louder or adjust your mic. They're having difficulty hearing you. Sure, I will try. Is this better? It seems better to me. Okay. Um, but just let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll help you out. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question was, was whether service coordinators are actually still doing IPP meetings. Um, and whether they're doing that over Zoom. So yes, the Regional Center is still doing uh, IPP meetings and planning meetings. They use the web WebEx format, um, although I do know that some families have requested Zoom and they've set up the meeting and, and had their meeting over uh, Zoom if they wanted. Um, but the Regional Center uses WebEx, which is similar to Zoom. So yes, IPP meetings have continued. Uh, service coordinators are working from home, but they're available. So if you haven't heard from your service coordinator, please reach out to them. Um, they were all asked to contact all of the families on their caseloads and check in with them, but that was months ago. So maybe you talked to them back in March, but haven't heard from them since. Um, if there's something that you need or want to talk about, please reach out to them. And, and um, if you have a hard time getting a hold of them, you're always welcome to ask for their supervisor. Um, Catherine also um, has shared her email in the chat box, and you can always you know contact Catherine. Or last week we had... Um, Lori Banalis and John Decker, all of them are, you know, say, feel free to contact any of them and they will make sure that your call gets uh, answered. So the other question was, shouldn't regional centers be sending emails instead of Facebook? So I'm, I'm not going to speak for the regional center. I don't work for the regional center, but um, the regional center does have a new website and they do have multiple different email listings. So please go to their website, the new one, uh, make sure you're on a, a browser that's, that works well for their website, otherwise you won't see all the options. And you can join their email list, and their email list is, has a, six or eight different categories. So sign up for all the categories that you're interested in, and then hopefully you'll be getting those emails. In addition, they post a lot of their things on their new Facebook page, so definitely follow their Facebook page as well. Um, There was another question about residential uh, options and day program options. Um, Catherine will address some of that today. Um, and if you have questions that are not answered today, please feel free again to follow up with your service coordinator about what's happening during COVID and as well um, when, regardless of COVID, about what service options there are. So those questions should go back to your planning team and your service coordinator. Um, and the last question I wanted to address was, can the regional center reduce in-home respite if a student is receiving education supports online during COVID? Now, the question was about reducing respite. In fact, the regional center automatically increased respite hours right at the beginning of COVID. So um, if you didn't hear about that or you're wondering about respite hours, again, please contact your service coordinator for details about that. Um, all right, so today we are fortunate, again, to have Catherine Weston. Uh, we've been working together and crossing paths for a couple years here and going out mm -hmm. to programs and talking to them about um, HCBS and, and this was all coming down in two or three years and what can we do to prepare. So um, we're still preparing, um, but it's getting closer and closer. So we're glad to start this conversation with families and providers and all of you here about what HCBS means. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Catherine and let you introduce yourself a little bit, tell a little bit about your background and what your role is at the Regional Center. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Sonia, for inviting me in. Um, I'm really excited to get to talk about one of my most passionate topics, um, HCBS and the CMS final rule. Um, not that I'm a nerd about regulations necessarily, but I find that this really um, is an opportunity to talk about why we do what we do and how um, to do it the best that we can, which is fun for me. So a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm Catherine. I work at Alta Regional Center. Um, I got into this field actually in 1997. 
I kind of stumbled into it when I was looking for a summer job during college and I landed in a day program for adults with cerebral palsy and totally loved it. Um, I didn't know much about developmental disabilities at the time, but I got to know the participants and the staff and I found it to be such a positive atmosphere. Um, and I got to know people in ways that I wouldn't have expected to and it really made an impact on me personally. Uh, and that changed my trajectory of my life. Um, it changed my career path, the kind of jobs that I pursued. Um, I had an opportunity about uh, 11 years ago to join the regional center system. And that was at first at Regional Center of the East Bay. So I worked as a case manager, that's the term over there, um, for about three years. And then when I came to Alta Regional Center, it's the same position, but they call it service coordinator. Um, and I was there about three years doing um, that work in case management, working with families, working with individuals, writing individual program plans, lining up services, supporting people. Um, and about five years ago, I transitioned to the community services department, working with vendorization for our service providers. So specifically, I was focusing on services like day programs, uh, transportation, interpreting, that kind of thing. About three years ago, a position came available to focus on HCBS and the CMS final rule implementation. And this is something that we had kind of understood was coming down the pike. There are changes coming, regulations that impact our services. What does that look like? And this is a role where I get to be a support for our vendors, as well as our staff at the regional center and families as well with your questions about everything to do with implementation of the final rule. So my hope today is to be a resource for you guys. Um, I know there can be a lot, it feels like, and hopefully we can break it down to kind of give you the flavor of this is what it's about. Out. Um, this is how you can learn more about it. There will be more in-depth trainings coming if you've got a lot of specific questions, but I always love questions. Um, please gather your questions for me. I think we won't have enough time today to cover all of them, but email me, uh, reach out to me, and I will definitely connect with you if you have questions that aren't answered. Thank you, Catherine. And just a reminder that Catherine's email is in the chat box. Um, Catherine also wanted to share some other resources um, for later when you want to do some more reading. Uh, the, a link to DDS's website is there uh, with their HCBS regulations information, also similar information on Alter Regional's website. Um, and then if you're looking in the chat, there are the links to the two trainings, um, link to SCDD's website, uh, link to all of our previous recorded Zoom chats, they're all on YouTube, um, and my email address as well. Um, okay, so Catherine, could you give a little bit of an overview of the different roles at the regional center? What does a service coordinator do versus uh, resource development or community services, uh, the unit that you're in? Um, how does that differentiate? What, what, what are those roles, roles, responsibilities? Sure. So most people are familiar with the case management side of the regional center. That's the majority of the staff. That's the majority of the interaction um, with families, with the public, um, where we have service coordinators that will be assigned with individuals who are eligible for regional center services. So every person who is eligible will have their assigned service coordinator who will work with them to develop an individual program plan and um, we usually call that an IPP. And please forgive me if I start rattling off acronyms, catch me, because I'm trying to be better about that. Um, but it's really designing an individualized plan to talk about what is this individual's goals? What are the objectives they have for their life? What are their dreams? What do they want to do? What do they want to accomplish? And what kind of supports will they need to accomplish those goals and to stay healthy and safe? And how can we assist people in connecting with the resources that are out there? All right, so that's a lot of the service coordinator role. If you have questions about how do I find housing for my child, how do I find a you know increase in respite or a day program that meets their needs, please talk to your service coordinator because they're going to know your um, your family member the best and will know what's in your area and um, what's available right now. 
Now there's also the Community Services Department, and this is uh, more of a focus on the vendors, the service providers that we contract with. So we assist people to go through the vendorization process, filling out all the paperwork, completing a program design, um, making sure that people know and understand and follow the applicable regulations, um, California state regulations, um, such as Title 17, if they're licensed, there's Title 22 regulations, so we'll correspond with licensing as well. Um, and then federally, there are now the CMS final rule requirements um, that I'm going to be talking about today. We also have um, some clinical staff, um, nurse, doctor, psychologist, that um, can do consultations and assessments on an as-needed basis. Thank you, Catherine. That's helpful. So what is the CMS final rule? What is this? It sounds so serious and final. <laughs> um, so the final rule is a reference to a change in regulations that actually were already in place um, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So at the regional center, we pay for certain services. The majority of that funding comes through the California state budget, but also there's funding that is reimbursed to the state from the federal government. Now, of course, when there's money, there's strings attached, right? So if you know, you're gonna qualify for that funding, there are certain rules that you have to follow. And there were specifications put in place in 2014 that was an update to the regulations at the time. And so that is referred to the final rule. You might hear the settings rule, the HCBS rule, the CMS rule. It's all the same rule. I know it's a little bit confusing, um, but as, I've been learning more about this and really focusing on this. Um, I've seen that there's such an emphasis on person-centered planning, um, being the foundation for all of the, the planning and the services that we provide. Um, if you were gonna try and make a rule or some kind of um, expectation of everybody having person-centered planning, I think this final rule is a way to try and put that on paper, if you will. Thank you. So what does it say? What are some of the elements of the CMS final rule? So broadly, I think there's kind of two main uh, ways to look at it. The final rule is saying that services need to be individualized and they need to promote integration into the community. So really the intent of this funding is that people are having experiences um, of community life like you and I, and we are not funding any services that would be an institutional type of experience. Um, the whole purpose of the Medicaid waiver program was to bring people out of institutions into the community, but there wasn't really a close look on how are we gonna enforce that it's the experience we want them to have. So to not have an institutional experience, but in a smaller setting. So I will be diving into the specifics on that in those later trainings, but I'm gonna run through some, some of the main things that it covers in the ruling. So the final rule talks about um, individual choice, right? Promoting and supporting people to have autonomy in their life. It talks about inclusion in the community and experiencing um, the full benefit of community life. Um, it talks about individuals' rights to privacy and dignity and respect. Um, it talks about choice about who's providing services and supports. There are specific requirements to residential services, um, such as privacy, if someone wants to have their own uh, living space or if they're going to share a room to have a choice of a roommate. Um, choices about schedules, you know, when do they want to eat their meals? When do they want to um, go to bed? When do they want to have their visitors? Um, to be able to lock the door for privacy on their bedroom if that's something that they choose to do. Um, and that the setting is physically accessible to the individual so that people are able to access all of the, the areas and uh, amenities of the home. does the CMS rule apply to? Okay, good question. So the final rule is written to apply to settings where services are provided um, and that are funded through the home and community-based services waiver. 
So that applies to most of the services funded by the regional center. I think one of the main exclusions would be an ICF facility that's funded separately and under different regulations. But other than that, all of the regional center services would be considered HCBS. Um, we are looking at settings um, the places, the service providers to be uh, compliant with the final rule regulations. Now, while everybody is expected to be following those rules, um, DDS is only assessing certain um, types of providers at this time where it looks like they might have a little bit more difficulty um, at times or some more challenges implementing those requirements. And that would be places where um, there might be a site where people are gathered for the purpose of providing services and services are designed specifically for people with disabilities. So is that becoming um, a segregating type of environment? Um, are the services provided on a site controlled by the provider or is it someplace that is um, open and accessible to the public at large? So we're looking a little bit more closely at those settings, um, but really any of our HCBS services would be expected to follow those rules. Now, that's a little bit challenging sometimes for families and service coordinators too, to know well, what do we do with this final rule, right? Because the settings, the providers um, are responsible to show that they're doing what they're supposed to do. But it's also important that all of us understand um, what to expect from service providers and that we're not asking them to do anything that really they shouldn't be or can't be under regulation. When does this all take effect? We've been working and planning for several years and some dates have gotten changed, so that gets confusing. I know. And so would you believe it's already taken effect? It actually was considered to be in effect when it was initially adopted, which was March 17, 2014. So the expectation is these are um, the requirements that people are going to be doing now. And any of our new vendorizations, new day programs, new care homes, we're expecting that they are implementing these requirements. Now there is an understanding if there's a setting that was designed with a different um, set of requirements in mind, it might take them some time to make some changes with ratios, location, um, what type of services are provided and how. And actually we've had some providers take a look at their own services and say, I don't really know if we can do that in our previous services, but we've got an idea of something we wanna do that we think is gonna be even better. And so they've been working with the community services department to come up with a new vendorization and launch a new program and new options. So um, for those providers who have been um, given some time to take some, uh, take a look at what they're doing and want to make some changes. There have been different deadlines given to when those changes have to be done. So they were originally given five years. It was extended and it was just extended again this past month. So that deadline is going to be 2023. All right, so March 17th, 2023, about three years out, um, if providers need to make changes because we don't want anybody to lose their services. Right, we don't want anybody to lose choice. We want people to have more choice. That's what it's all about. And so giving extra time to um, assess services, consider what changes might be in the future, um, change vendorizations or create new vendorizations, um, we've got some time for that to happen. Great, so we actually just had a question in the chat that is very yeah. similar to, to one that we were gonna ask next. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask both of those and you can answer. So one is, can you describe what an adult day program looks like under the new rules? How is individual choice accommodated in group type settings? And another question that had come in during registration was how will you reconcile the greater good in a residential mm -hmm. setting if it conflicts with personal choice of an individual in that care home? So those are similar questions. Oh, good question. And the answer, it's kind of hard and simple at the same time. And that is, it really depends. It depends on what the service is designed to do and who they're serving in that setting. So if I look at a behavior management program that might be um, stationed on a site controlled by the provider, um, services are provided there on the site with other people with disabilities, if I'm going to consider referring someone to this program, they live in their own home, they've been working a job full time out in the community, that would be terribly restrictive for that individual and it wouldn't be an appropriate fit. Um, and if they were going to 
um, try and keep that individual on site, it would be segregating to that person because it doesn't meet their needs. However, I know of a lot of other individuals who may be struggling with anxiety and might have had some challenges with behavior and might not be safe right now in a fully community-based setting. And for them to even go out of their home and be around some peers might be a huge step in independence and growth for them. And so maybe that would be a good fit for that individual. So it's really important um, that when you are considering a, a setting for services that it's going to be um, a good fit um, and that you are very clear as a planning team, what are the goals and the needs for support that you're looking for? Thank you, and we can, we can let folks ask additional questions in a few minutes regarding those situations. So are there specific questions that should be asked during the IPP individual program plan uh, planning meetings that will help with all of this planning and finding the right structure of a program? Sure. I think it's really helpful to talk about um, different type of goals. What are the short-term goals? What are things that we need to do or accomplish this year? But what are some longer-term goals? You know, we don't always talk about um, where do you want to live in 10 years? You know, do you want to be living in your own apartment or with a roommate or at home with your family? You know, people have different preferences. Um, do they want to be working in a certain type of career field or exploring some kind of um, enrichment program through a day program? There are lots of services that might be um, enjoyable and positive experiences today, but they might not be taking me to that long-term goal. So we need to connect the dots that this is an appropriate setting and it's helping me to accomplish those goals that I have. So we wanna see that the goals we have today match up with the longer term goals. So that's really helpful to include in those IPP discussions. Also, it's really important to talk about where someone may have um, certain skills and where they may have needs for support. And um, often I hear um, a reference to someone as needing um, supervision for safety. And definitely we want supervision to be offered when that is needed to keep someone safe. But there's not as often a discussion about in what context um, that that supervision may be needed. Perhaps someone might be perfectly safe at home where they're comfortable and they know the environment versus being in a strange uh, new location where they don't know anybody, they don't know how to get around. Um, maybe supervision is appropriate in one circumstance but not in the other. So we wanna make sure that we're not um, setting up our service providers to be um, overly restrictive or providing more support that someone needs because that's limiting to a person's independence. So that is very helpful as well. Um, and where that plays out is when there's discussions about um, maybe a recreational activity. Um, I might work with somebody who really wants to go to the movies more often or go roller skating and they live in a group home and the staff's telling them, well, we don't have enough staff to take you as often as you want to go. We've got a lot of other people, we've got schedules and yeah, we'll take you every once in a while, but maybe not to what you would choose if it was up to you. Well, maybe the conversation could include do you need a staff person with you at your side at the movie theater? Or is that something that you could do safely on your own? And now we're looking at more of a transportation discussion. Can you get dropped off or picked up? And if so, maybe your friend can pick you up, you know, every once in a while. So now we're facilitating someone to participate in the community and participate in activities that are of their interest. And we're not making it based on the staff schedule as much as that person's um, interest and need. And when I have been out talking with providers um, about their services and does it meet the final rule requirements, um, sometimes it's hard for me to know. Even as much as I've been uh, studying the final rule and I might read program designs, um, if I don't know the individual um, in that setting, it's hard for me to know if their needs are being met or not. Now, there was one example where I was talking to a group home provider and she was telling me, Yes, um, the residents all participate um, in the community and activities they enjoy. And for example, they all go to church every Sunday. And she explained to me that they all go to the same church. 
And I was a little bit surprised to hear this because I've been around people that go to church and I know sometimes it's hard to find four people in the same family that all want to choose the same church because they have different preferences with music and the preaching and activities and, um, you know, for all sorts of reasons. So why is it that these four individuals from different background, different ages, different cultural contexts would all choose the same church? Is it that they are choosing it because that's their preference? Or is it because it's convenient for the staff to all drive to one location rather than to four different locations that morning? So I don't know if that's, um, you know, uh, following the final rule requirements or not. If it's something that is written in the IPP of what that person wants to do and the providers supporting them to do it, then I can affirm, yes, they are being compliant with the final rule requirements. So it sounds like it comes down partly to the person-centered planning. Absolutely. And, yeah. Can you talk a little more about that? Is there a right way and a wrong way to do person-centered planning? Is there a specific methodology that you have to use or, um, you know, is it the same as the IPP? Uh, Talk a little more about person centered planning. Sure. Person centered planning is the process, and it's really putting the individual at the center of it. What is important to that person? Um, what do they enjoy? Um, what helps them to be happy, content, satisfied? And what is important for them? Um, that's where you're looking at health and safety and um, dignity. You know, what are the services and supports that they need um, to have a balance of those things? So, with the final rule, it's moving away from the provider setting the rules and more towards the needs of the individual driving the services. So it's not as much that the provider is controlling everything that's happening, but they are more of a guide and support and a coach to assist a person with what they need. And the more that we can include that um, in that IPP documentation, it's really helpful for providers to know what to do because they're implementing those IPP plans. Um, and then it's also helpful for those that are assessing to see are their needs being met in this setting. And I think there was a question um, that had come up about exceptions potentially to final rule requirements because one of one of my experiences when talking about this is we start thinking of, well, I don't know if that's safe for, for so-and-so. If they had unlimited access to food, like I'm just imagining, you know, what's going to happen? Or if they lock their door, is that going to be safe for them? And so I want to assure you that there are um, means to provide for those cases. So there can be exceptions. And, and there is a prescribed way on how to handle those situations when they come up. So we want to see that the planning team has assessed that there may be a specific need. Um, maybe there's a doctor's diagnosis of Prater Willie. So we want to make sure that we're writing in exactly what kind of needs for support for them to be safe in, in the settings where they're receiving services. Um, so we're going to describe in the IPP what kind of supports we've tried um, that maybe haven't worked. Um, what exactly is the data to measure that um, what we're going to try to do is effective, um, that the individual is consenting to this type of support because they still have um, rights as far as how they're receiving services. We want assurance that supports will cause no harm to the individual. Uh, and we're going to take a look at this um, at least annually, if not more often, to make sure that any restrictions are still appropriate. And we want to look at the intent of promoting independence uh, and choice whenever possible, you know, while still maintaining health and safety. So. I had someone say to me, well, my client couldn't um, have a key to his room because he has pica and he would eat it. Well, I certainly do not want to see anyone swallowing a key. Um, that's not what we're saying to do. The rule says that doors would be lockable. So now let's get creative and how can we meet the intent of uh, security um, with someone's bedroom and their belongings, right? So maybe we, instead of using the key, have a door with a keypad lock and they're memorizing a combination where they and their staff would know what that would be. Um, maybe it wouldn't be safe for them to be locked in a room, but we could have some kind of um, lockbox for belongings that they don't want other people getting into and we keep, can keep their belongings secure. So there are ways that we can explore um, what it would look like for each individual. Catherine, we have a question um, from Sid who wants to know who's responsible for the for doing the PCP, the person-centered plan. I know that's something that we've been talking about for a couple of years. Is that the service coordinator? Is it the day program? Is it the residential staff? Um, 
And who decides that an actual PCP took place? Is it sufficient enough? So person-centered planning is the process for creating the regional center individual program plan. And that's something that is written by the service coordinator in conjunction with input from the individual and whoever they would like to be a part of their planning team. It could be family members, it could be, you know, their day program staff or other people that are in their life that are important to them. So if someone is receiving regional center services, they will have an IPP. Now, if they're receiving services, say, from a day program, that day program would also be responsible to develop their own individual service plan. Again, we want that to be person-centered, that what the services are relate to that individual's need and not everybody gets the same thing. It's not a cookie-cutter approach. But there's not going to be a separate person-centered plan document necessarily. Um, there are ways to do that um, as kind of a way of gathering information, but that's not required for regional center or for um, other services. Okay, so Sid, what do you think about that answer? Does that answer your question? It's, uh, in my mind, it's still a little bit vague of who's responsible. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really vague. Yeah. Because we know that there are terrific programs and terrific service coordinators and we also know that there are programs and service coordinators who aren't and I see the potential of both of them at some point saying I didn't even know I was responsible for doing a PCP I don't I don't know how to do a PCP we're not doing that so I I, I think it I I see some issues with it so the regional center service coordinator is responsible for writing the document that is the IPP with that person center planning process. And if you have an IPP about you or someone in your family that you don't agree with, talk to your service coordinator and see um, what is it that might need to be updated to more accurately reflect the needs and goals that you want to have included. And, and I'm, I'm also concerned because I, I work with many families. Um, I'm also concerned that families have no idea that that, that is the intent of the IPP. Um, my son's 30, no one's ever told me that. The only reason I know it is professionally. So there, I think there, I think there's some serious gaps in that. Yeah, that's good to know, thank you. I mean, definitely um, you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, and I encourage people to connect with other families. Um, if you have support groups in your area, um, other peers in, in programs that you may be participating in, um, and to reach out to um, people like Sonia, who has a ton of resources and loves to get people connected um, and lots of trainings available as well. So where there are um, those gaps in information of we just want more information about what, what this even means or what should we be asking, um, if you want to type those up and email to the, email them to me, I would be happy to pass them along. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. I think that person center planning is um, maybe something we could actually spend more time on specifically in a future uh, conversation. And from what we've seen in, in California, um, as well as in the self determination program that some of you are learning about as well, that's new here. Um, there's not a specific person-centered planning method that is prescribed in law. It just says person-centered planning will be the foundation. Um, and so you're mentioning it as well, but there's, when you go online and Google person-centered planning, there's different methods of doing it. And no one is prescribing one individual method in California. It's more of a process. Um, and so it does leave it for a little bit of, of confusion or ambiguity or vagueness. Um, so, you're saying, you know, reach out to your service coordinator, make sure that all of the people involved in your family member's life are, um, a, are part of making decisions and a part of giving information toward the IPP process. Um, you want input from even if it's the neighbor or the doctor or best friend, and it doesn't need to just be the service coordinator and the family and the individual. It, it can be a group of people giving input to the process, especially when we're talking about HCBS and really finding supports that are going to meet that person's needs and help them thrive. 
So we'll keep looking at that, Sid. I think it's definitely an issue that um, we want to keep looking at. Um, DDS had hosted some trainings about the final rule that really focus on person-centered planning specifically because that's so foundational to what the final rule is all about. So if you've got a little bit of time and you enjoy listening to webinars, I would highly recommend them. So you can find those on the DDS um, website on their HCBS page. There's a trainings and information tab. Um, if you're not able to search through and find it, email me and I'll send you a link directly. Thank you. And, and a starting place would be that link in the chat. Uh, to get to the HCBS section on DDS's mm -hmm. website. Um, so, yeah. Well, so how can you summarize a little bit about HCBS for all of us and what we've talked about already today? Sure. It, it can feel so big because there's so many elements of it. But, you know, I try to summarize by thinking about that focus on person-centered planning of really making sure all services are about the individual, what they need, what they're looking to accomplish, how to support them. So that person-centered planning, um, as I mentioned before, that services are individualized and integrated. So also combining that with that um, concept of community inclusion, that we're promoting greater access to the full community um, rather than limiting to um, just a, a smaller group um, that may be segregated. Thinking about the role of the service provider, um, not in a controlling environment, but more of a supportive relationship. And, and taking a look at that. Um, making sure that the services and supports are decided by the planning team um, where services are needed, that it's um, related to what the planning team has talked about. Um, that it's not about anyone's diagnosis or label or, um, or any limitation like that, but it should really be about the individual. And then finding the best setting where um, they can be supported there. And then also when you run into those roadblocks of, I don't know how we're going to do this or we're not permitted to do this because of some licensing regulation, when you feel like um, things are bumping up against one another, um, to ask the question, what would it take? What would it take um, for us to get there? What are those barriers? And not just taking that no for an answer, but to look at um, what it would take. Um, I've seen situations in, um, for example, in a residential care facility where people were um, pretty independent and didn't have challenging behaviors and really interested in cooking. And they're concerned about um, this licensing requirement for locking up knives when there was no safety issue um, with the individuals that live in that particular home. Now, is it a broad rule that homes are supposed to lock up their knives? Yes. But when it's not necessary, and it is part of these individuals' goals and plans that they want to learn how to cook and have access to the kitchen equipment, um, you can actually approach licensing for waivers on specific rules like that. So sometimes it's just knowing that you can even ask for these things. Um, but you have to start with, what is it that we want to do and what is it going to take for us to get there? in chat here. Um, I just reposted okay. the links, but just so everyone knows, you can always scroll up in the chat to see previous uh, posts, but I did repost those links. Um, and then we have a couple questions here. Um, where did they go? Uh, is person-centered, is the person-centered plan from traditional ALTA different from PCP for self-determination? There are private providers of PCP development and not clear who should be using them. So yeah, there, there's a big, do you want to try to explain that difference of PCP under sure. self-determination? So self-determination program, it's um, a newer option for receiving services um, as opposed to the traditional method. And so preparing for that self-determination process, there is a requirement for person-centered planning um, to be a part of that, to really go um, maybe even more in depth than people have had the time to do in the past. Um, people that have had specific training on how to um, pull in information um, from different spheres of someone's life to really think about um, what kind of supports they may need that might have knowledge about different ways of supports being provided, um, kind of 
um, a, yeah, more in-depth uh, approach to the planning process and using that to write that IPP for someone starting self-determination. Um, so it's not required to use um, a, a certified and vendored entity to do that. Um, but I think there is becoming more and more of a focus on person-centered planning and what does it look like and how can we know that we're doing it and doing it well. Um, even though it has been part of the um, Lanterman Act requirements that the IPPs are done in a person-centered approach, um, but I think we're trying to flesh out what that means and really making sure that we're doing it well as we transition into self-determination. So we have a question about um, whether, if a family and individuals would prefer a congregate setting or mm -hmm. a, group, a group setting, is that allowed if that's that person or the family's choice? So choice is important. We want to see that it's not the provider that is limiting options to access the community, that it's not the provider who is segregating the individual. Um, they should be working with them according to what their goals and needs are. Now, if there is um, something going on where maybe someone would rather stay in than go out because of anxiety, are we just saying, okay, just stay in because you're anxious? Or are we saying, stay here, get comfortable, and we're going to work with you on some relaxation techniques and ways to um, address that anxiety so that you're not going to be trapped by it in your future, but that you will have more, cho more choices available to you as you go forward. I will mention that there have been questions to CMS about um, like intentional communities, like places of living, and whether that was something that um, would be allowed. And where it's um, a setting designed around maybe a specific diagnosis. Um, we're limiting um, access to people who have this specific disability and there's not integration. Um, maybe it's what you want. CMS has said that is your choice to do that, but we're not necessarily going to fund it. So that was the conversation, you know, as of a few years ago when, when that was kind of coming up and being talked about. So I think um, there's more of a sense of we want to support people with their choice and we also want to make sure that they're not being unnecessarily um, restricted or segregated. So that's where those IPP discussions are really helpful to talk about what people's goals are, that this is what they want. It's not what the SC is saying, it's not what the regional center is saying that you have to do, it's what the individual wants to do and making sure that their needs are met. Thank you. And that, that's a tough one that I'm sure is going to be discussed more and more over the next year or two. Um, I wanted, we've got definitely more time for questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll now so we can do that and then we'll resume with questions. So feel free to continue to, uh, I see some more questions coming in. So please feel free to uh, put your questions in there or um, we can kick you off move, move, uh, mute. But I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll right now. Um, oh, okay. So I'm going to read the question. Um, did you learn something about home and community based services and how it will shape service options? And the second question is, are you satisfied with this activity? So if you're willing to just answer those questions. Are you able to see the poll? I don't. You don't see it? No. Oh, that's because I didn't launch it. I'm launching it now. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. I could see it. Sonia, are we able to ask um, some feedback of the participants here? I'm curious if final rule is something that planning teams are talking about currently. Maybe some are and some haven't been. I'm curious to know um, what that looks like right now. Okay, let's just finish this up and then we could do a little mm -hmm. informal poll with um, just raising hands. Okay, I'm gonna go, 30 of you have responded. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share the results. And hold on one second, I'm going to capture that. OK, 
Okay, Catherine, go ahead and ask your question because they can hear you and then we'll get the screen back in just a second. Yeah, so I would love um, your input now. How many of you have heard about the final rule or have had discussions in your planning team about the final rule and how it may impact your services? Um, I think it's happening in some planning teams, but maybe not in all. And I'd be curious um, to take the temperature of the room here as that were um, to see how many of you are having those experiences right now. So if you have, if it's been mentioned at all in your IPP planning uh, meetings, uh, raise your hand. Let me look on page two. Oh, so we don't have video. We don't have a video on a lot of folks. Um, well, if anybody wants to share if it was mentioned or has been mentioned, please feel free to do so. We can. Um, I see a hand up. Daijmi says that uh, her hand is up. Do you, are you saying yes to the question or do you want to ask a question? Oh, I see. E. Poster? Go. I see two hands. So maybe that means people are not having a lot of these discussions right now. Yeah. Um, yes for me. <laughs> it, it has been mentioned in your planning team? Yes. Uh, we, are, we are starting to mention it and uh, after the training with the BMRC about HCBS. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Who has not been asked? Or who has had planning team meetings, but it has not come up? Okay, let's see. Okay, so more people have not had it brought up in their IPP meetings. I still only see one hand, so maybe I'm not seeing everything that you're seeing, Sonia. I see Magdalene, I see Brenda, Sid, Selena, um, Veronica, Kim, uh, Laura, um, and Kathleen. So yeah, quite a few people are uh, sharing. Quite a few people are saying it has not been brought up in their meetings. Um, okay. Well, I think that's something we can definitely um, encourage, you know, on our end as a regional center to our own staff, as well as with our providers, um, you know, share, sharing some of these ideas about um, how to promote choice and what is an individual's goals and how can we um, support them more individually with the final rule uh, expectations. Sonia, I did have one other thing that came to mind I'd like to bring up since we've got a couple more minutes and I'm a little bit surprised nobody's asked it yet, but maybe they're thinking it. And that is what about COVID? And how does that impact um, the final rule requirements? Yeah. Um, this is something that I've been thinking quite a bit about obviously from home here um, where I'm sheltering in place. Um, but we have had a lot of our services um, look different than they did um, before March. And how does the final rule impact those? Um, you know, some of our day programs may not have been meeting, people may not have been going in the community, people may not have been um, able to interact with visitors at their home. And those are supposed to be um, a big focus of what the final rule says. So um, to start with, you know, what I see is that we all are facing a different world right now. I'm working from home rather than in my office. I'm not going out to the same places that I used to go. Um, my experience of community is uh, much more limited than it used to be, as I'm sure has impacted many of you as well. So people that may be receiving services are part of that same world <laughs> that we're experiencing um, right now. When it comes to services and the settings where they're provided, um, this is something that we're taking a look at. Right. Um, you know, there's been concern about the more people that are receiving services at a specific setting, the more segregating it can become. Um, now we're looking at that may not be the safest place for them to be receiving services, just with the risk of germs. And so the focus has been on more um, individualized services and less big groups. And I think this is just um, solidifying that even more. Um, as providers are thinking about what services may look like in the future, you know, a lot of day programs are reimagining 
what our service is going to be when we come back. Are we going to be doing um, something similar or something totally different? They're looking at um, how to be safe with COVID, but also the final rule requirements are a part of that. And I think they're not at odds with one another. They do support one another. Um, so that's good and positive. We've been kind of preparing with lots of conversations over the past several years. So um, it's kind of like, well, here we are. Let's do it. Let's make more of that transition away from maybe some of our bigger site-based services to maybe smaller or more um, community-based services. Um, I wanted to mention that two of our offices uh, have been hosting something called a Festival of Learning. Um, and as soon as we get the recordings of that, there was a one last night, which was their second Festival of Learning. And last night they featured four or five individuals who are involved in very person-centered uh, supports and programming in, in the community to, to really meet their goals in a very person-centered way. So those would be a, that would be a great um, discussion or session for you to watch um, the recording. And I believe they plan to continue to do those to feature individuals um, who are regional center clients, but um, from all over the state and who are doing various things that are very unique um, to their own interests and goals and how the supports are supporting them to achieve their goals. So I encourage you to watch, um, watch that session. We'll try to get the recording uh, link of it out to all of you. Um, and if you have stories or um, examples you want to share, please, uh, we can connect you with them because they'd love to feature lots of individual examples to help all of us um, get inspired. Um, I just would welcome anyone who wants to ask a question. We've got a few more minutes um, to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Or if we, if we missed your question in the chat, please feel free to just unmute and ask it. I have a question. When will we know as a parent um, when to start asking questions um, for future planning? And my son is 24, going on 25. I think um, a lot of us that have uh, young adult children in day programs, and we have an awesome day program. But with our service coordinators, when do we know is the, you know, the right time and what type of questions should we ask regarding future planning? Well, you should be having at least annual meetings for IPP. We do that. Mm -hmm. So when you're together, that is a perfect time to talk about um, all the goals for now as well as for the future. And as a family, I think you can be thinking about what makes sense you know, for us, what makes sense for you as an individual, where is it that you're going to be thriving? And what are the steps um, to get there? Do, do we need additional training and cooking and money management? Or do we need help finding a roommate? What are the steps that we need to take? Um, what are the bridges that we need to cross? So I'd say it's never too early to just be talking about it. Um, doesn't mean you have to do it right now. Um, but I mean, you could even be looking at um, asking for tours of what does a group home look like versus a supported living or versus independent living situation. Um, they can look very different. And so that's something where you could be gathering information and just learning about uh, the process. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, my concern is with self-determination coming up next year, um, my my daughter is 23, going to be 24. She's not using day program right now because of COVID. We're not doing respite because of COVID because we're afraid of having people coming into our home and bringing COVID into the home. So we're not using many services. So when self-determination comes, her budget's going to be small, smaller um, in, in regards to what money is going to be available for self-determination. Um, and that, that kind of concerns me, but I'm looking at her, the health, our health, and also the day program was closed. Um, it, it, I feel like, are we gonna be punished when self, our, the service, the, our money, our pot, pot it's, is it gonna be so, so small when self-determination comes around next year? 
Sure, that's definitely an understandable concern because typically you look at what was the budget last year, you know, what was spent right. on, on services. And I've heard kind of a variation of this question um, before COVID happened. And that was, what if, say, we've been approved for respite, but we don't have a respite provider in our area, so we haven't been able to use it? Or does that mean we won't be able to? And the answer is, of course, you'll be able to apply what you would have spent if it had been available. Um, and incorporate that into the new budget. Because right now, if there wasn't COVID, you would be using those day program services right. and you would be using those rep services. And right. so that's still gonna be a need in the future. It's not, not a need right now. It's just not able to be met um, in a way that makes sense for you. So have that conversation with the regional center. When you're doing the IPP, still include that as the goal and the need. So it's written in there, you know, we want day program and training in these areas. We want respite, uh, you know, and these kind of support. So even if you're not using it right now, it's still recorded and documented as an identified need. Well, I was told though that when self-determination comes that the budget, the amount of money that's gonna be available for funding it would be based on the year ahead, but we're almost going to be we're going to be almost a full year of COVID. So I mean, I'm hearing that the day programs aren't going to be opening up until maybe October, November, or December. Or um, I'm definitely not using rest, but I'm just really concerned that her budget, when self determination comes, it's going to be real small. Well, you know, so. I'm just, I'm really concerned about that. That's a negotiation process, a discussion that you have with your planning team and with the regional center. So obviously COVID was not in the plans when these rules were written um, and it was in nobody's plans. But um, I think like Catherine said, everyone understands that things changed during COVID. And so services maybe that you would have been using, you were not able to access. And so that will be something okay. that will be a discussion and your budget may be adjusted by your regional center. Um, and there may be, there's a, there are processes within that budget discussion to look at things that are needed that weren't used the previous year or weren't thought of the previous year. So that it's a discussion and a negotiation. Okay. Um, so don't feel like just because you had no services this year because of COVID that that's going to horribly affect self-determination, your okay. self-determination budget. Yeah, it's definitely a discussion that you'll have with the planning team and figuring out what an appropriate budget would be. And needs okay. change. And in this year, you might have had some changes and thoughts about what your daughter would want to do. And so those can also affect the budget because some of those services might, you know, cost a different amount of money or, or now, you know, be a service that you would like, a support that she would like um, that you hadn't thought of or she wasn't using a year ago. So things change and that's okay too. And I think a, a okay. number of people mentioned having children who are, you know, in 20 to 25 year range. Obviously everyone's going through a lot of changes during that time. And, um, and so budgets also can change based on what kind of um, supports that they're looking at at wanting to achieve their goals in the community. Okay. A, lot, a lot of change happens in that, you know, the early 20s, for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We can definitely stay a couple minutes longer. So I want to make sure that you have a chance to ask questions. And again, reminding you that we will get into the weeds on more detail about these trainings in September and October. But please feel free to just unmute and ask any questions. Right I now. just I just wanted a little bit more clarification on the adult day programs. Um, so, you know, we talk about giving individuals choice and flexibility, but I just don't really understand how that works from a provider perspective. Um, like, are the, are the ratios going to increase? I mean, if you have one individual that doesn't want to go into the community and three individuals that do, or vice versa, how does that work from a provider perspective? Sure, so ratios are attached to um, service codes in a funding model. Basically, it's um, how we set up a vendorization on our end. Um, what the services are gonna look like should be outlined in the program design. And it's up to a provider what kind of services they intend to provide. So someone might say, I only intend to provide one to three ratio staff to participant, 
or someone may say, I'm going to provide one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and those would be vendored under um, different service codes and would have different um, specifications in the program design. So it's up to the program to connect with their community services specialist to talk about what the services are going to be and make sure that the vendorizations are um, set up to do that. But anyone can say, I want to start offering one-to-one -one services if that is a need that they see um, about them in the community. Right, and we had talked about one-to-one -one services, but um, I, th I think I was told, you know, if you guys um, ask for a one-to-one -one service model, be prepared to get, you know, individuals with behaviors that really need that service model. So it, I just feel like, like what we're, as a provider, what we're going to be asked to do and, and the parameters that are put on us from the design perspective that they're just not meshing. And I just don't see how we're supposed to make it work. So if you've got specific things in mind that you want to accomplish and what it might look like, maybe you and I can sit down with your um, specialist and talk about um, your program design plans and what that would look like for you. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Thank you. Yeah. Another question. Um, Veronica had a question about what is self-determination, and I would be happy to um, uh, talk to you uh, offline afterwards because um, that's a whole different discussion. Um, and also there's lots of resources online that we can refer you to. Alter Regional Center's website has a link for self-determination. DDS's website also has a link for self-determination. There are videos, um, short videos, five minutes long, and then there are trainings that you can see that are an hour or so long. So a lot of ways to learn about self-determination. Um, and I'm trying to think right now if we've already had a chat about self-determination. Kathy, did we? I don't think so. I don't think yeah. specifically. Um, so we'll look into that's a good a idea though. Yeah, we'll definitely look into doing a chat specifically on self determination, but there's a lot going on with it. Um, it is in its pilot phase, not pilot phase, but soft rollout phase right now um, for the next year. Um, so happy to talk um, about that and give you a little bit of an orientation to self determination. Yeah. Um, and we'll look at having that as a topic. Yeah. So any other questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for taking the time to introduce us. It's yeah. a very complicated topic. It's not simple. Um, we'll have two more full trainings on it um, with a lot more detail. So please go ahead and register for those. Um, if Kathy, if you can just post that those links one more time. Um, okay. Apparently, when people joined late, they can't scroll to earlier uh, posts. So just post that one more time. We'll leave it up for a minute to, for people to grab those links. Um, I will add you all to our uh, statewide email and my local email list. Um, and just to let you know, I have a secret email list, which is uh, much smaller, where I forward things all the time. And, and you, for you know, flyers for events and trainings and things happening, uh, sometimes five to 10 times a day, I'll forward something. So if you'd like to be on that email list, please feel free to send me an email. I would never put anyone on that list without your permission, and you're always welcome to get off of it at any time. So um, if you want to be on that list, uh, feel free to just send me an email. Um, otherwise, we'll add you to our bigger um, regional list and our statewide list. Um, and again, remember to go to the regional center's website to sign up for their email lists. There are a number of different options, um, and so definitely specify which ones you want to get emails about. Um, there's also uh, various uh, well, I wanted to mention that Kathy in, and a group of uh, community-based organizations, we've been working together on putting together, SID is part of that, um, a list of um, parent support groups, self-advocate support groups, uh, Facebook chats, uh, a place where you can find trainings that are recorded. Um, and we hope to be launching that uh, Google Doc in the next week or two so that all of you can see that. That will also be a good place for you to uh, access other individuals as well as information on the internet. So um, that will be coming shortly. So thank you all for taking the time. Thank you, Catherine. And um, please always feel free to contact Catherine with specific questions um, and or Kathy or myself. And we look forward to seeing you again. Um, next week is our uh, State Council uh, Regional Advisory Committee that we have every other month. You're welcome to be a part of that. So it's a two hour advisory committee meeting. 
and then we'll have a training in the third hour. Um, and then uh, our chat after that, which is going to be August 25th, will be with our new um, OCRA, the Office of Clients Rights Advocate for the Regional Center, for our Alta California Regional Center, Kelsey. And um, she will be covering the IPP, so processes of um, having your IPP, tips about the IPP, and appeals processes if you disagree with something. So we welcome you to join um, that chat where we'll be talking about the IPP process specifically. So again, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you, have a great day everyone. Thank you.